Thank you for everybody attending today and um, hello, welcome Croeso to this afternoon's SRA Cymru webinar. I'm Rachel Hughes and I'm the trustee of the Social Research Association and um, I'm also chair of the Wales branch here in, here in Wales. So the SRA, um, if, you're, if you're not aware, is a membership organisation for social researchers. So as a charity, we aim to advance the conduct, development and application of social research for the benefit of public interest and advance knowledge and professional practice in social research. And one of our activities is to facilitate learning opportunities such as this today. So on to today's webinar, I'm very pleased and proud to welcome Professor Jane Williams, Arwin Roberts and Helen Dale to talk to us about Lleisha Bach, Little Voices. Now Lleisha Bach was an eight year project which was funded by the lottery and hosted by Funky Dragon and then subsequently by Swansea and Bangor Universities. It supported research teams of children in schools and communities throughout Wales to bring about change and to contribute to policy and decision making on issues that are important to them. I'm very, very much looking forward to hearing about the project. Um, I've heard lots about it um, and want to learn some more. Um, and I'm sure it will stimulate lots of thinking about its potential applicability for you too. Um, thank you very much and over to the team. Yeah. Hello. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start, Rachel. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I Very briefly, just to introduce ourselves, and then I'm going to ask Arwen to start our little slideshow. So I am, as you say, Jane Williams, a professor in the Hillary Rodden Clinton School of Law at Swansea University, and I'm one of the co-founders and coordinators of the Observatory on Human Rights of Children, which is also based at Swansea and Bangor Universities. It's probably enough for now. Arwen, introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Arwen Roberts and I'm a lecturer at the School of Educational Sciences here in Bangor University, um, lecturing on the Childhood and Youth Studies course. Hi, I'm Helen Dale. Um, I spent over a decade working with children and people um, on the Children as Researchers method and I'm currently a Transformation Manager for the Children and Young People programme at the West Glamorgan Regional Partnership. Thank you both, and Arwen, perhaps you can start the slideshow. Thank you. So, I mean, we are really grateful for the opportunity to present. We love talking about our work, supporting children as researchers and change, change makers over the years, and how we think it speaks to various different policy and research agendas. We'd like to talk a bit about sort of where, where we, we're going, where we think we're going next, and we'd love to engage in conversations with um, whoever would like to talk to us about it. I think it'd be useful probably to have a brief history um, of the um, of the work, if you'd like to go on to the, the next slide, Aaron. Um, um, because um, it's, it's a little bit unusual. It's not got a, a conventional um, academic or social research background. The history actually spans closer to, to two than just one decade when I think about it, because it follows in some ways a certain trajectory on children's rights and participation in Wales which has been, as I'm sure many people know, a consistent strand in the, in the tapestry of devolved public policy in Wales. So um, before 2008, when um, this little um, timeline starts, there had already been um, a, 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 that, that theme established in Welsh public policy, Welsh government support for an organisation called Funky Dragon, child-led or rather youth-led 11 to 23-year-old uh, led reporting to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child under the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, and um, it was against that background that in 2008 to 2009, the Welsh Government funded the first pilot to see whether that child-led approach could actually be applied to children under 11. And that's that's the origin of Fleischbach with Voices. Um, and that was followed up by the then um, Participation Support Unit funded by the Welsh Local Government Association, joining with Funky Dragon um, to, um, to conduct a, a further project. But thereafter, the funding from 2012 through to 2020 came from the National Lottery. And the um, 2012 to 14 project coincided with the, the cessation of Funky Dragon as a Children and Young People's Assembly for Wales, which is what it had been, um, and a journey that that took um, that particular form of participation of children in Wales um, into the Welsh Youth Parliament that we now have. 
um, but that left the um, the grant begging a home, and that's how Swansea and Bangor Universities stepped into that breach because they had recently formed the Observatory um, on Human Rights of Children in Wales. So those successing, successive funding then came from the National Lottery Community Fund, People and Places. The initial um, work um, um, with 12 local authorities, schools and community groups in Wales, and then the 2014 to 17 work, Little Voices Shouting Out, <clears throat> did produce, um, to everybody's delight, um, what we think is a global first, a child-led report uh, on, on the condition of children's rights in Wales, led by under 11 year olds to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, as well as delivering, I think some 72 local research projects throughout Wales, each one of which has produced local impact. And we were able to further test and evaluate the methods. We then got further funding 2017 to 2020, and we're able to conduct another tranche of um, local and national projects, but we're focusing more and more during that period on equipping adults with the, as well as children with the skills and the methods and understandings, as well as the opportunities to work together uh, on a basis of equality to bring about change. I should say that um, throughout all of this, the two distinguishing features in terms of methodology um, were these, that first of all, the children always identified the topics they want to explore. So it's not, it's not like most social research um, projects engaging with children in that way. The children identified the topics, they selected the questions, the methods of inquiry, and the outcomes they wanted to achieve. And secondly, the UNCRC, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, was explicitly used as a framework for the whole um, endeavor, uh, as a frame within which the children selected those issues, which obviously gave them quite a wide canvas to draw upon, but it did frame their selection, an ethical framework for the conduct of all the projects and activities, and a political space for impact, influence, and change making. Um, so moving on, um, just a word about how this fitted so nicely within the um, within the objectives and the purpose of the uh, of the observatory. Um, the uh, I don't need to go into the history of the observatory, but it is also part of that story of children's rights in Wales. Really, um, the observatory is a um, is a loose collection of people sharing common interests, basically, <laughs> with a home in Swansea and Bangor universities and facilities and support there. Um, and we've developed a way of looking at practical implementation of children's rights, which involves three interconnected and interdependent strands of activity, research, embedding and accountability, with partnership working, interdisciplinarity and direct engagement with children, with professionals, public bodies, and so on, as ways of working throughout all of those strands. And um, as will become clear, Flash About Little Voices speaks within each strand, but is preeminently a way of empowering children as researchers and change agents through deployment of a rights framework and methods enabling children to lead at all the stages of the research process. I'm going to ask Helen now to go quick, as quite briefly through the six stages of the, of the methodology. Um, Helen and Arwen, I should say, are really the people who have developed and deployed and reflected on and further refined this methodology over the years. Thank you, Helen. I think Arwen's got this slide. <laughs> oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I panic there. There we go. Yes. Um, so the Theatre Bath Little Voices process works through a series of stages. Um, Helen will go through them a bit, a bit in a bit more detail later on, but the, the six um, stages are rights approach and selecting the research question, choosing research methods and then planning the research, going out and collecting um, and analysing the data, then planning for age-inclusive co-production, following up with the children, and then um, more co-production and, and future planning. So how this worked was it we were delivering it um, over several weeks. Um, so we come in for an afternoon or a morning session with, with groups and work through a stage at a time. 
Um, and we all we also did it over over two or three days sometimes in in schools if that suited um if that suited suited the group, you know. And most of the time we were adapting things as we went along to suit the needs of the of the of the groups. So over the over the period of the, over the, the time of um Lisa Bach, we had quite a few um exciting for us anyway, uh, achievements. Um we were the only Welsh NCCP gauge finalists. Um we trained 600 professionals over the over the course of the years. We had training days um and we've we also we had a a, um, a university co a course going going on in, in Swansea University and training days in both Bangor and um, and Swansea University. We had the as Jane mentioned before we had the what we think is the world first UN um, UN report by under 11 children um, to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child back in 2015-16. We think um, it's around a thousand children as researchers um, got tra got trained over the over the course of the project. Um, we also held some climate as held four climate change summits as climate change was one of the um, one of the big topics that kept coming up in the last in in the last um, last tranche of funding. Um, it was it was. In so many of the projects, um, and it was you know it was, so we thought we'd we'd take that on and talk a bit and try and try and try and have some summits about it. So we had two in Bangor and two in Swansea. Um, we also we we responded to Welsh government consultations. One of those was in the climate change summits as well. So we we um, with with environment participated in children and young people's committee inquiries. Um, and we involve children themselves in 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 those. Um, so we enable children, some of those some of those who'd been through us with projects, to to give their opinions in in um, the children children and people's committee. We also um, the first Welsh Youth Parliament um, used our children as such as methods, um, and we trained them. In the first in uh, the, in the first children youth uh, in the first youth parliament. So um, as Jane mentioned, I'll I'll put the mentee up in a second now. Well, one of the things we one of the things we that was really important was that the children, the young people, got to decide um, what the topics were for research. And we thought it'd be interesting for you to tell us what you think um, the children research. So I need to share. There we go. Is that working? So take a couple of minutes and you can um, have a think about what, what do you think the children were, were, would want to research? You never used Menti before. Um, you go to menti.com, as it says on the top of the um, slide, and use the code four six five five seven six one three. Excellent. Yes. Well. Um, so I think most of these were were topics over the years. The only thing that wasn't a topic um, was COVID nineteen because the the funding finished just at the start of COVID. Yeah, these the I'll, we'll, and um, the next slide, but I'm going to go through some of the topics that that we that we when that we spoke with the children about. Well, thanks for that. Thanks for your input on that. Interesting. So, what did they research? Um, so, as we said. They, they could they could choose um they could choose any topic within reason um we had we had methods of course to um to work work down from the hundred ideas on a big sheet of paper down to top ten top three and then ways of of working through those topics to see if they if, see if it was something that that could form a research a research project and they were the they could so, so topics were voted out as we went forward. 
So most of the ideas were altruistic things, um, especially in primary schools. They were choosing things that would benefit other children. Disadvantaged groups came up a lot. We had lots and lots of school-based projects, sort of re, you know, from really minor issues within the, within the school itself, more football to play time type of things, um, lesson lesson based things. So you know they wanted to inform the curriculum, more more P and things like that, as well as well being projects within the school. We had fruit shops. So one school costed a fruit stand in school and presented the evidence to the head. Um, there were cooking lessons. School school cook was really happy to help with that. No one had mentioned it before in the school. It just came. Um, so the school were really happy to do that. I think they did. They made some smoothies and tried to bring that into the curriculum. Um, school gardens, helping grants to get flowers in the school. So we did all kinds of things. We had banning smoking in parks as well. Um, and that work was um that work came up as well in the in the UN report. So we had all kinds of things. Some schools wanted to talk about children's rights and the UNCRC, um, internet safety, children's health. More slides. We had um Organ donation was one of my projects. It was one of the. It was a really interesting topic to discuss with nine-year-olds. Um, so this was at the time when the law was changing in Wales. There were adverts on the television, and they wanted to know more about it. So what we did there was we put them together with um, a professor who was part of changing the law, who was working on the law itself, and an organ donation nurse, so that they could. Um, so they they found out more about it, and we had. Lots of interesting discussions about it, about who's who um who got to decide. And they found out in the end that children don't have any kind of say really um in in what happens to them if something like that does if something bad happens to them um with as regards to an um, organ donation. So we had mountain school. Um we had the school that had the mountain right next to the school. Um some say it's a hill, but um, I think they they called it a mountain, and um, they they wanted to use it more. Some of the children had never been never been up the mountain, and they had it was a really interesting one. It had different, all kinds of fossils and things like that, and there was some history. And the school really took that on board, and the head teacher walked them all up there and um, told them to to think of all the curriculum links that they could find while they were up there, and they integrated it into their curriculum. In the last few years of the project, a lot of schools took on plastics. Um, it was, I think, once once the Richard Attenborough, um, Dave Attenborough, sorry, uh, the program was on. It was it was a hot topic for us. Um, one school worked to eliminate single use bottles from school, um, installing more water coolers and providing bottles to the pupils after after finding the evidence. And I think they they calculated how many how many plastic bottles were being used in the school, and um, took that evidence to the head, and created change. Um, we had lots of fundraising projects, raising money for people in other countries, um, raising money for homeless people in their local area, collecting. Um, things like that. We had several schools that looked at at water in other countries um, and raised money for 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 children in other countries that didn't have as much as them. And I'm sure that came about through um, through through the the fact that we we were starting with um, rights and what kind of things children need, and they were thinking about children that that needed that that, that weren't getting their rights. Um, things like scary news. Um, so you know, what kind of stuff they were seeing on the news in newspapers and and on the radio um they thought it was that some some people thought that it was it was too scary for chip for for little children they were they were um the news was depressing and they 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 really looked into into that adults using mobile phones was an interesting one um had to be treated sen sensitively there um and it was it was really it was that one was really interesting. 
so yeah, they, we had all kinds of topics, and all the all the topics that we've that we the that were discussed um, are all on on the on the Cliche Bach website. And I believe that Rachel's um, she might have said it already, but I'm just going to share the, uh, that uh, that with you. So, so Helen, over to you. Thank you. So our reports, our training manual and resources are available on, online, but I will cover a flavour of methods in pictures. So sometimes we'd start projects with child rights education. However, being able to adapt to the needs and the dynamic of the group, we'd sometimes start with what is important to the children, starting from where they are and what relates to them, and that sometimes meant that with this approach, we didn't fail with children's rights education throughout the dialogue and activities as their projects progress. And this did come with expertise, experience and reflective practice before, during and after as you experience the learning with the children. So in terms of starting with the rights approach, we'd facilitate interactive presentations on the UNCRC and children's rights with a focus on activities that explored the children's rights in the life of a child. Things like, what do you need to survive? Things that make you healthy, things that make you grow uh, independently. Looking at children's days without their rights and what that could impact and why our children's rights are important. So when it came to selecting the research questions, they would explore what things made them uh, what, what, what things that made them worry? What did they? What would they like to change, make better, raise awareness of, or campaign about? And this would help them think about all the different things that they wanted their project to focus on that was important to them at that moment in time. They would vote on their top three topics or issues, and they would undertake an activity with an exploration wheel, as we call it, and they would look at the issues and the problems around the themes that they picked, but they'd also think about the solutions as well. And sometimes this would aid with formalizing their research questions. Sometimes they'd pick a theme that they thought was really, really important, but actually when they did the exploration wheel, they found that actually it was a very long process to be able to make the changes that they wanted or it might it meant that they had a lot of issues but maybe very um limited solutions and they really wanted to make a difference so once they explored their top three issues they would vote on their final research area so when choosing a research question and methods we'd explore the ideas of research they would explore different methods via participative activities and by participating in these activities themselves, it was a good way to explain that when they do their own research project, all of those things and questions that they experience would be designed by them, the methods, the participants they wanted to involve, um, and how to plan their own and make those decisions themselves. So when it came to planning their research, they would consider the who, the what, the where, the when, the why, and the how, um, and especially those who could be potential, potential influencers and enablers of their work to co-produce their solutions into action. They would discuss what they wanted to find out and create their questions, looking back to their exploration wheels and, and bring in solutions into what they wanted to find out about as well. So they would decide uh, who they wanted to ask. They would design their research methods from various examples, such as suggestion boxes, questionnaires, pictures, um, you know, sometimes to very, very fine detail. So they would make a plan how to run their research, almost like a delivery plan if they were going to run a lesson or a session or workshop. And then before they would conduct their research, we would obviously take them through ethics involved in research, how we can protect them from being safe when conducting their own, but also making sure that the environment of the for the research participants was right as well. And we would infuse the national participation standards within the approach and discuss how they will ensure that those are met on the research day. 
So this is always interesting, the, the execution of data collection. So we would support the children to conduct their research, whether it be um, online and we would use um, various uh, platforms to support the uh, collection of information via online surveys. It might be in the classes across a year group or a whole school in which they'd be very busy going around the classes on a set time on a certain day, or whether it might be going to uh, meetings and um, committees with experts to gather their views and opinions. And all, all those would depend on what the children decided to conduct as their research project. So this is also a fun bit, working alongside the children to analyse their own results, but using suitable, adaptable methods where they can understand their data based on their capabilities. Sometimes we'd have children who were in year um, four, five and six, so that's uh, eight, nine, 10, 11, who would be very active in using technology and they would look at the spreadsheet, they would look at the information on the screen and be able to analyse the information in their own way. Sometimes we'd have to support other children. Um, we'd produce you know, the visual graphs and speak with them. What does that mean to you? Um, is, is, is there something that you would like to reflect on this piece of information? And working together, we would make recommendations based on their own ideas of the information and their own ideas of the solution of the solutions to um, address the information presented. So planning for age inclusive co-production. So we would host co-production meetings and these could be in a school setting, in a community setting, online. Children and adults would work together to achieve the change, developing the necessary capacity of children but also more importantly, the adults for that effective age-inclusive participation in community development and community action. So when we refer to effective participation, we mean the process in which all participants choose to engage and which results in influence or decisions or actions, as well as producing positive effects on the individuals taking part. And by community development, we mean making changes to improve the life of communities such changes may need to be driven at organisational, local community, Wales, UK, or even sometimes an international basis or a combination. And by community action, we mean collaborative or joint actions aimed at driving such changes. So this might mean creating a presentation for a local action meeting. It could be a celebratory event at the end of the project, but where possible, we'd ensure the right people, decision makers, stakeholders would be there to support the children, members of the Senate, committees, local councillors, council departments such as the environment or education, their own parents. Sometimes we'd be working with these children on a fortnightly basis over a 12-month period. Their commitment was extremely important to us. So the school, the school governors and any practitioners the, the local press to invite, were invited to find out about the children's projects and collaborate most importantly on promises and actions to help the children further their work post the Little Voices project. Whatever promises were made at the events were written up, pledges, promises and passed on to the schools of the projects and we turn those into a plan to continue the work without the delivery and support of myself and Arwen. So it's extremely vital to work with the children to progress the change as soon as the action is required by professionals. So sometimes it's not possible for the children to be involved and that's okay, but explain, draw out the process and keep them informed. Um, further co-production and age inclusive planning, just keep keeping on bringing adults and children together to plan for the change. Kind of like when we were all hosting our online meetings or gatherings about you know project planning and how, how to take it to the next step to achieve the actions um, and create case studies to share and disseminate the research. For every project that we did, we created case studies or reports, very visual, very colourful, that would represent um, a, an, an option for dissemination that they could themselves design and also take part in disseminating themselves. 
But I just want to note that the children would always decide when they wanted added involvement, be it at the very start to help them design their research, whether it be as participants of their research or as partners to create the change that they required based on their, in, their, their data collection. And children always selected their own topic area that was not driven by adult agendas. So as well as submitting the World First Report from under 11 as part of the UK UNCRC monitoring process, the method has also attracted national and international audience. For example, previous Welsh Government Minister Jane Davidson's hashtag Future Gen Lessons from a Small Country book and Angelina Jolie's Know Your Rights and Claim Them, Volume 1, and they will be reflected upon in Volume 2 as well. Over to you, Jane. Oh, thank, thank you both. That real whistle stop tour. This has been such a, a rich and varied experience that, um, you know, obviously we've tried to give a flavour of it today, um, but it has certainly been one of the things that has um, stimulated the, you know, the, the most thought and the most change in myself as a as an academic, as a citizen, as I, somebody who I hope is a, a, a thinker and a and and somebody who 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 just wants to find ways of making the world a little bit better. The power of this um, methodology that Helen and Arwen have been practicing now, because they came in from the original Funky Dragon projects and have been with it all the way through. The power of it is really quite um, quite humbling in some situations. Anyway, where where now? Because we've told the story up to the um, the end of the last uh, big lottery. A grant, but obviously we're still we're still here um, as a as, as as a team, but in 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 different um, uh, in different roles. So we got uh, you know all of this experience and the tried and tested methods of putting children at the heart of social action for change. I mean, it, it clearly speaks to implementation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, human rights generally, but also in Wales the the well-being of future generations agenda where participation is so significant, where the commissioner has joined forces with the children's commissioner to emphasize the importance of children's rights approaches and participation engagement with children. The whole new curriculum, three to 16, values-based, prizing the development of ethically informed citizens, um, um, the social services and wellbeing Wales Act within the framework of which Helen is now um, engaged as a, uh, it, with, with the West Glamorgan uh, Regional Partnership, um, uh, also with the, the you know the element of, of, of principles derived from the Rights Conventions, um, and the wider social justice and human rights agenda generally. So it seems to be highly relevant in terms of public policy, and um, to my mind, any governmental body or public authority, any NGO, private sector body, anybody who wants to engage better with children. Could potentially benefit from the deployment or adaptation of, of this approach or aspects um, of it. So, and it seems to us, based on our experience, to hold very wide potential for social research. And indeed, we've engaged with a number of academic researchers to help them to adapt and deploy aspects of the methods. So, from about midway through that last lottery funded project, our thinking was focusing increasingly on embedding these approaches however call, if we call it slash bark or call it something else, it wouldn't matter. But uh, maybe within the new values-based curriculum, it, that was not the only opportunity, there are those other statutory frameworks. But integral to that would be building a community of practice and significantly scaling up the professional training that we've been able to do. So you'd be talking about schools and public services, work many of which workforces are regulated and training frameworks set out by statute so that was leading us really to the conclusion that this was calling um for strategic level action perhaps less amenable less appropriate for charitable funding compared to the community level projects we delivered directly now it must be said that covid did disrupt some of our last projects um in 2020, and to some extent, it disrupted the continuity of our thinking. It threw us all um, uh, into uh, uh, disarray for a little while. But but we had we did um, um, pivot 
and hold some online engagements which can have contributed to the body of knowledge about the impact of COVID and school closures and so on on children. And the observatory has since assisted Welsh Government in its own review of pupil voice during and um, after um, the COVID restrictions. Uh, some of us are working on an ESRC funded project on children's participation in schools, trying to develop uh, notions of participative pedagogies, a notion which obviously aligns very closely to the Trifab Bark approach. Arwin um, is engaged in his own um, MRES um, re research and uh, has plans for a, a PhD, which is highly complementary to all of that. As part of that, he's mentioned the school su summits that he's been able to get going again, and we hope to be able to find ways to replicate those sorts of activities across Wales. Um, he's involved in the first evaluation of the Welsh Youth Parliament. Helen's also been involved in evaluation with an observatory colleague called Rian Croke. They've been looking at one of the um, UNICEF Child Friendly City initiatives in Cardiff, working, deploying aspects of the methodology you've just heard about with a group of children to evaluate that. Um, and you know, the work increasingly features in my own and academic colleagues teaching, for example, that spanning law, education, health, childhood studies, global challenges and, and, and so forth. We did manage to um, produce an article. I think a link can be shared with you. It's in social sciences last year, where we were looking at integrating sustainable development and children's rights using Wales as a case study. And we discussed there the, um, the um, deployment of these methods and, and participation as a key part of um, integration of those two broad policy agendas. And I think that the observatory as a whole has gathered momentum across all the strands of its activity um, because, of, uh, because of our involvement with this project. Um, I think that's probably enough from us. We'd just love to hear your reactions, take questions, very interested to learn what, if any, resonances, what we've talked about here has for the people here who've been kind enough to still be listening. Um, thank you to my colleagues. And over to Rachel, perhaps to invite those questions. Yeah. Comments. Well, thank you very much, Diolch and Fawr Iawn. Um, Ichi, Gyd. Um, really just so amazing. And I just want to echo Karen's comment, which she's put in the, co in the chat here. This is one of the most exciting pieces of research projects that you've heard for, you heard about in a long while. And um, I completely and utterly agree. agree. Um, it, it's just fabulous. We have got a couple of questions already, one in the chat, and one in the Q&A. So maybe we'll kick off there. And please, if it sparks any other ideas or comments and things from anybody in the audience, please, you know, do do say. So I'll start with, I think it was, um, let me go to it, Rebecca asked in the chat, she'd love to know a bit more about the children, what children thought about the adult mo mobile phone use. <laughs> And yeah, I'd like to know that too. Um, and is there any further information available on, on this? Um, I think, Adwin, you mentioned it, didn't you, in, in your section of the presentation? I'm happy to answer that. I think it was one of the projects in South Wales. Um, although, again, have to be careful. <laughs> um, it was just um, as we were teaching the children about their rights, empowering them to have their voice and have an opinion, there was various things that they seemed to be picking out within the environment around them. So that could have been in their families, it could be in the community, or it could be at school. And um, adults' use of mobile phone was increasingly a concern, using them in cars whilst driving, um, at attention from the children to the phones, phones in adults' hands continuously, and the children just felt that they've got a lot of um, restrictions on themselves as children, but who's calling up the adults for their behaviours and who's raising awareness of um, those uh, um, um, amongst themselves and, and in the community really. So, and, and again, it was around the time that some of the law was changing. And, and what I find really interesting with the children's projects is sometimes they would pick up on topics and issues a lot quicker than maybe policy um, was, was identifying, but they'd always be um, on the ball with, with recognising what was going on in the wider um, uh, arena as well. 
Thank you. I think some of the some of the resources and um, some of the project work and things I think is is on the website, isn't it? So I think you know do have a explore around the website. I think the website's amazing. Um, it's really really helpful. But yeah, there's more there's more information there too. Thank you, Helen. I've got some. I've got a bunch of questions. So we'll try and. I'm really keen that we move through these because they're really, really interesting questions. We'll start at the top. So what sort of meth participatory, can't even speak, participatory activities were used to explore methods? Could you talk a little bit about that, please? Can you, can you repeat that? Sorry. Yeah, it's, the questions are in the Q&A as well. I don't know whether you can see them, but this yeah. is what sort of participatory activities were used to explore the methods. I think there was an image, wasn't there, with um, there was a bunch of sheets where you had those open for the children to explore what kind of methods they might might want to use as part of their project. So I'm assuming it's around that. What kind of activities did you did you undertake to help them explore those different types of methods? Yeah, so um, we, we had to make it fun and engaging for the age group. So some of the things that we did were um, blow, uh, put little questions in balloons and then blow them up. And then they had to go around and burst their balloon and pick out the question and the whole group would give their opinion and somebody would scribe. Um, we would allow them to participate in a fake survey that we created so that they knew how that online space could work if they were designing one and taking part in one, being young, giving their views in, in, into that space. We would create questionnaires where they could um, uh, participate and, and post in a suggestion box. And we'd do various workshops. And obviously, throughout the delivery of the whole method, what they didn't realize is they were already taking part in research activities. They were involved in workshops where we were presenting them with questions and they would put their answers down on post-its. Very creative, participative activities that helped progress the projects, but at the same time, we do well enough as actual research methods as well. I don't know any other colleagues who can think of some of this. It's been a little while. We, uh, as the years went on, we, we, we brought technology into it as well, using things like um, yeah. clickers, so um, using barcodes and things to 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 get opinions really quickly, and things like that. So we you know we we they'd have a go at that, and they they could then they could decide if they weren't enjoying them when they were having a practice with it. Well, probably the 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 participant weren't weren't going to enjoy them as well. So that so we um we used all kinds of different things over the years, and we chop and change as we went on and what was what suited and as we saw new stuff we we changed them uh, thank you i hope i hope that helps so it helped me thank you um another question here very inspiring work thank you for sharing could you share a little bit more about the exploration wheel what is it and how was it used to help the children determine their topics yeah, I'm happy to do that, Aaron. Do you want to share the slides so that they, people can see the visual? And there is the template in the training manual as well. But um, what we found is when we would ask the children their initial, what's important to you? What things would you like to change, improve, campaign about? They would either, you know, create a list or they would put post-its on a piece of flip chart and we kind of, you know, uh, join them together. But on the bottom right there, we, we, we discovered this, you know, an exploration wheel, as we called it. So what they would do is they would pick their top three topics. And then what they would do is in the middle, they would put the topic. So if you can see there, there's news on the screen. So what, were they, would, what they would do then in the inner ring would, that's where they would explore, right, what are the issues? What are the challenges? You know, what's, what's the problem, basically, from their perspective? And then on the outer ring, we'd use that as solutions. So each issue, problem, or um, anything that they put in the inner circle, they would also then come up with their own solution or ideas to improve that problem. So not only were they exploring you know, the negative impact, but they were also already looking to what they wanted to achieve potentially before they designed their research. And sometimes those would help them identify the questions that they actually wanted to focus on in, in their research. But I think I mentioned in my presentation, this, this was a really good way 
of helping the children to understand the value and importance of getting the right question or the right theme or the right project to work on because sometimes they would pick something that was extremely valuable and important and really needed to change but maybe the solutions were very challenging or it was difficult for them to maybe uh, agree the right path and then sometimes you'd have an exploration wheel that was absolutely covered in lots of different um, examples and, and ideas and it was natural that you know, the one with the most things on might be the one that they they they, they picked as their priority. But it, it like I said, it did it did really differ. We also used we had trees, didn't we? Where you put yeah. the root to the problem, really cheesy, down at the bottom, and um, so you know what were the issues down at the bottom? Then in the leaves, you'd have um, what they thought might might be solutions, and then on the fruit of the tree, then they put down who they could who they thought could help them and we had, the, we had another one with flower pots as well these methods are or oh, there's um in the in our research um research guide on the website there's links to um principles for all of those a um a previous um member of the senate uh, um did actually help us to design almost an influencing plan as well so that when it came to having the data, the information, the recommendations and the solutions, obviously dissemination on that is, is, is important. But it's also identifying the people who can help, what might hinder and, and, and just really, you know, uh, innovative ways to get the children's messages um, and, and, and to where it needed to go, really. That's really important. Yeah, great. Thank you. We've got nine questions um, still in, in the chat, and I'm really, really keen to, because, you know, it's it's great. This has really touched a nerve of people. Um, um, so I'm really keen if we can if we can answer as many as we can um, in that. Well, if we can answer all, but we've only got sort of five minutes left of, of the session. So we might go over a little bit. Um, so we start with, um, can you tell us more about ethical approvals? Now, those of us working in academia, know that can be sometimes a challenge and um, we've hit barriers before getting children and people's research passport process to involve them as co-researchers in health research it'd be really helpful if, if you've experienced anything similar or, or anything that could help overcome some of those perhaps some of those challenges and barriers this is a this is a really interesting one and the questions that follow behind it Rachel are really really lovely that we'd like to get into discussion and I don't know whether there's a possibility to for follow up afterwards because obviously people will have other things in their diaries this afternoon we're more than happy to engage in whatever way is is useful for people um but on this ethical approval this is really interesting because we've had quite heated discussions with academics about this um our I, I suspect that what your um, participant is talking about is slightly different from what we've done. So obviously, within university, you know, we've had we've got ethical clearance for our re, for our projects, right? Can I show our little voices? Um, the, the lottery funded projects aren't really conventional research projects. We weren't researching children. We've learned an enormous amount, but we didn't set out to research children. So they weren't research subjects or even research participants. It was an engagement project, something which is really tri trialing a method, if, 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 if the, the most you could put it, really. But what this was doing was supporting people in the community to, to use research to bring about change. So the ethical approval we needed was, was you know, to, to ensure that we'd got the skills and the training and the knowledge and the and 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 the, the quality overall to to ensure that the children are safe and the people that they would engage with would be safe as well. So that was all sort of done in advance. But where we've we've um, where we've had the interesting discussions is with academics who've said, well, you know, where was the ethical approval for what the children were going to do? Because they they were the researchers, and uh, and and well, the the our approach was that that was covered by the umbrella approval that we've got for the whole research and engagement projects. Um, and that there are layers of um, uh, supervision and, and layers of assurance that, that, that made sure that, that um, 
that, that it was uh, acceptable. But where you're looking, where you've got your own research project and you want to bring children in as co-researchers, I think that's a slightly different flavour. And I just wonder whether that might be, it's a discussion I'd love to have, obviously, because it is an issue in the application and deployment of, of these methods in social research. Mm. Yeah, great. Thank you. And linked to that, um, there's a question here about, did you use the children in the evaluation of any part of the project? So or have any reflections on how to possibly to do that? Yes, yes. We, we had the project evaluated twice. And in each case, um, the independent evaluator used participative methods with a selection of children who had been involved in, in our projects, as well as interviewing staff in the schools. Yeah, yeah. Great, thank you. I didn't notice in the, in the chat, Helen kindly said um, that if we're not able to answer all the questions, because I appreciate, you know, we've only got a smidge of time left, that we that the team will be happy to submit some written responses to yeah. the questions here, and, and we can circulate that in the post-webinar um, bump. It's a technical word, isn't it? Um, right, shall we have a quick... Are there any particular questions that the team are, are interested in? And answer, we've got another one around ethics. Whilst we're on ethics, what were some of the key ethical issues and how were they addressed? How, is there anything more we wanted to add? add to well, I, I think Helen and I both got lovely examples of that. I mean, I, I remember one uh, when, when it was it was about dog poo on the mountain, wasn't it? And the children wanted to put some um, sort of surveillance cameras to, to catch to catch unwary yeah. people who were not picking up after it was um it was one of the first projects in that pilot that they want recycling was pretty new um and they wanted to find out who's recycling in their village and the plan was that, that didn't happen obviously but the plan was they thought they they could hide in the bushes and they could put cameras in people's bins and then um we had to sit down and um, really think about ethics, about wh how how we got how you know and develop methods to talk about ethics and what's okay and what's not what's not okay. So that, that I think that's the one that started the big back when we were in Funky right at the start that started us talking about ethics and how to keep yeah them safe. So yeah, we 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 didn't end up hiding in any bushes. <laughs> I'm good. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Um, there's um, there's a couple of questions which are linked to inclusivity. Um, one from um, Luca, I think that's how you pronounce the name. Um, that participatory way, um, how best to do participatory research in inclusive ways with people who are less often heard. And there's also a question from Catherine, which is on the same sort of themes about representation from uh, neurodiverse children. Um, and were their priorities different, perhaps? So I think there's something around inclusivity. I think yeah. Helen's got some good examples there. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, don't, I don't mind um, as starting off answering that one. Um, when, when we, I think during the life of the project, we started off small, testing the methods, going into schools, uh, working potentially with um, children who were either opted onto the groups by their teachers themselves, but then as 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 the as the project and reputation and ways of working and learning and experiences developed, we were able to adapt our ways of working to support those children with additional barriers to participate. One, for example, was Cranbrook Special School in Torvine, who um, wanted to um, amplify the challenge that they were having when they were leaving their very well supported primary school every week they would go to the local um superstore to do some shopping for the school or they would pick up some items to take home with them at the end of the day but what they found was the children with um electrified or motorized wheelchairs or um uh, um scooters for example cars were parking on pavements and therefore were not able to sometimes leave the exit of their school because there was no drop down um, curbs or there was no matching drop down curbs at each other side. Sometimes the buses would be full so they'd have to wait sometimes quite a long time to for all of the group to get on one bus together because of the space that the, the buses are designed for. So they did a walk out through the GoPro camera. They had money from uh, the police hate crime funding that was supported by their local youth worker. And they documented in a video their challenges. 
And I think it's only this year that um, the Welsh Government or the Senate maybe have published some new guidance or, or legislation around cars parking on pavements. I'll have to dig that out. But this project was done you know, a, a good couple of years ago. We do have a YouTube channel. And if you want to find out um, about that project, it is the, the Crown Bridge Special School Project. And I really encourage you to, to watch that video. And then just answering the other question about um, those with N children with NDD or autism's involvement. Yes, um, the children were represented on, on some of our groups and they had very valid and important points. I remember one project from Pembrokeshire who identified the, uh, the school needing a uh, quiet reading area space. And the children prioritised that as something that would not just benefit those children, but would benefit everybody um, in the school as well. So it, it, it's hard to identify what ideas came from what children, but when they were together, they all represented each other and they represented issues that didn't just affect themselves when they were given their opinion, if that makes sense. And I think in terms of adapting your own... <laughs> In terms of adapting your own delivery, I mean, you've both worked with a variety of different children. In fact, in one of the, I think it was the last project that we set out to, um, to, to seek out children with additional barriers to participation. Yeah. So um, I, either within a group, a mixed group, or by, you know, mm -hmm. working with the, the, the special schools or, and, 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 and you, had, you have to adapt. Uh, you know so the 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 uh, the uh, the delivery, but I think it's reasonable to say that you didn't find that very difficult in practice because there's there's you're always working with the with the gatekeepers with people who know those children well and they know their their needs and so um, they can, they can be involved in ensuring that, that that works. Yeah, I mean to name a few, we've worked with people referral units, we've worked with care experienced children people, we've worked with young carers, we've worked with asylum seeking refugee children, um, just, just, just to name a few. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. And looking at the time, we've got a few a couple more questions, but I think perhaps what we'll do, because they're um, I think there are questions that other people would be really interested to hear the answers to. Perhaps we will do those as a written submission there in, in relation to the biggest challenges supporting children and young people um, and how you manage to teach the children about the topics. And also Karen mentioned here that, you know, she'd like to be able to take this to uh, to support local schools. And I'm thinking exactly the same as a chair of governors of our school. You know, and work. That I know Michael Michael Cantwell's on the on the call. Work that we're doing the public services boards in Wales as well, and how we use these methods in all our different forms of engagement. So any advice, support around those sorts of things would be really helpful in terms of any written response. But thank you so much to everybody for your attendance today, and and particularly to to the team for sharing the fabulous work that they've been doing and the amazing resources that are kind of a legacy there as well for the project um, and I just wish it was still continuing there's got to be some way in which we can continue with with this work it's great thank you so much we'll, we'll send the evaluation form round and the resources as well and obviously let you know when the recording is available yeah. um, on YouTube so you can share with with colleagues but thank you thank you